You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> Nationalist News. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday, the 15th of August. Rochdale rapists get a total of 24 years in our jails. Investigations into British deaths in falls are broad underway. 12 hour waits for patients on trolleys in A&E. Spanish might need another bailout and forest fires threaten the Canaries. Explosion in Damascus narrowly misses UM Hotel. The Reverend West and the EU Fox in the chicken pen. Thought for the day, a celebration in Rochdale. And finally, one flew over the cuckoo nest. No, really. UK News. A gang of Muslim rapists from Rochdale have been jailed for a total of 24 years. The men have been named as Abdul Sajid, 18, who received eight years, Amar Zahor, 18, got seven and a half years, and Osman Ali, 20, named as the ringleader, received eight and a half years. The white teenage student, 19, who is unnamed, went in good faith to visit the home of Amor Zahur with other friends to chill out. When they left, Zahur and Ali threatened her with a knife and forced her to perform sex acts on them both whilst being filmed on a mobile phone. Sometimes Zahur phoned up Sajid and told him to come round for some fun. The girl was then taken upstairs and repeatedly raped by Sajid and later by Ali and Zahur in a protracted attack she described as a living nightmare. A charge of forced imprisonment against all three men, which they denied, was ordered to lie on the file. A World Date reporter comments, This case is almost identical to the case of Ajmal Afridi, 19, Imtiaz Saeed and Tayyab Hussein, 19, in May 2008. In fact, we all know that these cases have been going on for years. This differs only slightly as the age of the victim was not that young, but the modus operandi of these beasts is just the same. Ply with drink and drugs, have fun time, and then start to pay for it. When are the authorities going to realise that this is just the tip of the iceberg, not the whole thing? An investigation into British people being killed abroad on holiday has begun. One of the major sources of British deaths abroad during the holiday season are falling from apartment or high-rise hotel balconies. There have been 13 cases of young people falling from balconies this year so far. Three of the cases resulted in death, whilst the rest have been seriously injured. These numbers top the total amount of those in 2011. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office and ABTA, the Travel Association, have joined forces on a campaign to help prevent balcony incidents amongst young people in popular holiday resorts. It was stated that most incidents involve young people between the ages of 18 and 35, and whilst not always the case, alcohol often plays a part. A World Date writer commented, I would think in this age group, abroad and with limitless access to cheap alcohol, it would factor heavily in these falls. Why can't the Brits call a spade a spade? British men and women are reported to be unaware of their free health checks. A study out shows that around 20% of GPs patients aged between 40 and 74 years old, only 14% actually turned up for their health checks. One spokesperson has commented, We would like to see all eligible adults taking part in these health checks and not leave it until you have problems with your health. The government has reported that 67,000 patients waited up to 12 hours on A&E NHS hospital trolleys whilst waiting for an emergency bed in the first six months of this year. It seems ironic whilst our government spend vast amounts of money abroad in puerile ventures that our own from 8 to 80 once again are ignored. Euronews. Spain is said to be open-minded over a sovereign bailout by the European Central Bank. Spain's Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy might be agreeable to asking the central bank to buy Spanish bonds if the negotiations are reasonable. Spain has a colossal 5.7 million people out of work in its country and is in dire need of help. If things were not bad enough for Spain, a large forest fire has broken out on one of the Canary Islands called La Gomera and has killed two firefighters so far. Their tourist industry, as well as the beautiful wildlife on the island, is under threat and officials in Spain are calling it an ecological disaster. World News It was reported by Reuters that a large explosion could be heard for miles across the Syrian capital Damascus early Wednesday morning. The explosion was reported to be a bomb detonated by Islamic rebels near a fuel truck injuring three Syrians at the present count. 
It follows on the bombing in the capital last month, which killed three of the Syrian president's security chiefs, including his brother-in-law. A committee of 57 Muslim groups is meeting in Mecca to decide whether to suspend Syria from their organisation. Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister Faisal Mekdad told reporters at the scene that the bombing proved the criminal and barbaric nature of those who carry out these attacks and their backers in Syria and abroad. The latest bomb narrowly missed a hotel which housed United Morons personnel. A World Date reporter comments, Baroness Amos, the United Morons Nation's Emergency Relief Coordinator, arrived in Damascus Tuesday for talks and was in Damascus at the time of the bombing, but unfortunately escaped being hurt. I now hand you over to the Reverend Robert West for his monthly observations. I want us to consider the House of Lords reform being pushed through by the Liberal Democrats within the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition and at the same time the heart of the beast, what is wrong with the European Union. House of Lords reform whilst the EU fox is in the chicken pen. It is now becoming pretty clear to many observers that the BBC has a cultural bias against Britain and all things British, not only in terms of race and religion. Since when did you hear, for example, the BBC standing up for the rights and interests of the British community? And since when did we see the BBC reporting properly the views and values of genuine evangelical and British Christianity? Almost never. The BBC takes a pro-EU stance. It has done little, if anything, to expose the EU superstate for the fraud that it is. In league with some of the newer universities and some of the further education colleges, it has covered up the anti-democratic fault lines with which the EU project is strewn, never mentioning them. Did you not know that the EU is not a democracy? If you did not, then the main reason is down to the BBC failing to inform you. They have never mentioned it, have they? Nor have they allowed anyone else to mention it on their airwaves. But surely we are being unfair. The EU has an elected parliament, does it not? Yes, it does. And the EU requires all member states to be democratic, does it not? Yes, it does. Well then, surely the EU is democratic. The correct examination answer is no. What the EU gives or requires with one hand, it takes away with the other. To take the two points in turn, yes, the EU does have an elected parliament of sorts, as we do. However, the EU Parliament cannot make and unmake law, known as a legislature, unlike the House of Commons or the US Congress. And that is the main role of an elected Parliament. It is like saying that your family has a car, but the car has no wheels and no engine. That is not very helpful. And the BBC never points it out or allows others to do so on air. The EU Parliament is thus something of a facade, a stage prop, to give the false impression that the EU is satisfactorily democratic when it is not. On the second point, the same impression is given. The EU requires all its member states to have elected law-making and law-reforming parliaments, which they all do. But what good is that if they are under and subject to a higher, unelected law-making process with greater powers over great swathes of your law? If a national democracy is in a supranational dictatorship, and that dictatorship is above it and has power over great areas, then really your national democracy has ceased in those areas, has it not? Areas of competence now given to the EU by treaty and by the creep of the European Court are great and growing. As one legal case said, it is like an incoming tide, and nor are such EU laws 
made democratically, and, which is equally important, nor can they be unmade. The treaties lay down, you see, that the law-making process is to be all in one direction, ever towards ever-growing unity. The legal proposals can only come from the unelected commissioners who have sworn and have been chosen to put the Union always before their own countries, a kind of institutionalised treason, and the laws are finally passed by or rejected by not the elected EU Parliament, but usually the unelected Council of Ministers, whilst the diminished veto on that Council of Ministers can put the national interest first, as it sometimes did under the Conservatives. The ministers on that council are the toadies of the Prime Minister, David Cameron in this case, and his clique, those funding the Conservative Party, who can use levers to appoint and dismiss them. Not very democratic at all. It is like a clique outside and above the gravitational orbit of the democratic and popular process. The BBC and other television media have a vital role to play in stopping this coming to light and so preventing the collapse of the undemocratic structure, hidden and protected as it is, by a general lack of awareness of it and by a democratic and media facade of the EU Parliament in Strasbourg and Brussels. Another diversion from this democratic deficit at the heart of the beast is the move, recently, by Nick Clegg of the Liberal Democrats to act as if the lack of democracy is being dealt with in reforming the House of Lords in Westminster. They say that an elected revising and reviewing chamber in Westminster, the House of Lords, will do the trick. But this simply gets us all going on a wild goose chase, whilst the EU fox is in the chicken pen, slaughtering our freedoms and our national independence. This is not the way the media should be treating the British public. In other areas, too, the media is, in, is complicit in covering up, stage-propping and otherwise creating diversions to get the many to give up on their country and its faith and identity. We will seek to do our best, month by month, to put the spotlight on each fox in turn. Thank you, Reverend, for your unique insight, and we look forward to next month's talk. Thought for the day, a celebration in Rochdale. Well, I'm off again, my friends. Rochdale has celebrated Pakistani Independence Day, apparently with great enthusiasm on the 14th of August, and the Pakistani flag was raised. Oh dear, oh very dear. The Olympic mushiness has reached the most endemically Muslim enclave in England. Rochdale should be celebrating the fact that just three of its Muslim rapists have been put behind bars, not sodding Pakistani Independence Day. If you look at the pictures, they're bad enough, with the following named idiots trumpeting their success of colonisation. I quote from Rochdale online. The Pakistani flag was raised by the Mayor of Rochdale, James Gartside, Labour MP Simon Danzuk, and Chairman of the Action for Pakistan, Ghulam Rasul Shazad OBE, watched by representatives of various organisations, including magistrates, local councillors and members of the Pakistani community. Ghulam Rasul Shazad recited verses of the Holy Quran and provided supporters with a brief background into Pakistani culture, including Ramadan. He also highlighted the progress made in all aspects of the community by Pakistanis and Kashmiris and paid tribute to the UK system in which there are Pakistani, Kashmiri and Muslim ministers, lords, MPs, mayors and councillors. <laughs> I wonder if that brief insight into Pakistani culture included the latest jail sentences meted out to three local Muslim youths for rape. In this case, although our modus operandi is exactly that used for underage girls, 
The white girl in question, although unnamed, was 19. She was, however, a student, which is yet another hunting ground for these oversexed animals. It must be apparent, even to the most pro-Islamic nutter, that there is a pattern to these crimes. The girls are always non-Muslim. They are approached in schools, pubs, universities, in fact anywhere where young girls go to have fun. Only this is another sort of fun that they will not enjoy. The first contact is always one-on-one, -on -one, or a group upon group, and as in this latest case they get the one targeted alone, then they bring their friends along for some fun. I am receiving letters and emails from parents whose lives have been ruined, along with those of their daughters, by these foreigners. And I am seeing only the tip of a very nasty and exploitive iceberg. These boys make every attempt to be seen to be integrated, even adopting the peculiar black patois so popular now with our youth. They even drink alcohol, which being Muslim is only allowed so these boys appear integrated into the society of youth. It has a means to an end, and that end is often white, Christian, very young and fresh. However, after being caught in a party house, her little tush will be available for all Muslim comers, if you will excuse that expression. The Muslim comeback is usually that these girls are vulnerable or streetwise. This is also a lie. Many of their victims come from united, happy families. The only sin their daughters have been guilty of is wanting a good time. When I was 15, I sneaked out of the house when my dear mother was asleep and headed for the nearest club with a pal in Brighton. They were the days, my friend. How we escaped with our virtue intact, I do not know. But in reality, times were different. Guys of a certain age looked on us as kids. They flirted, bought us baby sham, and then went on their way with very attractive young ladies considerably older than us. That was it. I spent my youth chasing teddy boys to no avail at all. Even the odd Turkish student, but that's another story. Still no luck. My husband has just said that I even admit to that, and yes, he had lovely blue eyes, if I remember rightly. Unfortunately, our young girls today have very different stories to tell, if in fact some live to tell it. Now, I'm not stirring up racial or religious hatred here, but I feel very strongly about what's going on under our noses and the fact that the authorities are still backtracking. Why can't we raid these Muslim enclaves where the suspected groomers live most often at our expense and simply deport the entire families? They are committing crimes against humanity, our humanity. What would happen if a case were brought before the Court of Human Rights in Brussels, highlighting just one of the many stories we know about? Should a country, any country, be forced to put up with this treatment of its young girls simply because a so-called community appears to enrich us? No, it should not. The one way to stop the Islamification of this country is to fight it on a religious basis. We are not Muslim. If we were, these attacks would not happen against our girls, which means it is religious discrimination, not racial. What gives one set of people the right to rape and groom youngsters without pity or mercy? I will tell you, a lazy, flaccid local police force, a corrupt and heavily muslim oriented local council, and a swathe of socialist do-gooders mumbling about community integration, thence the hypocritical flag-flying on the 14th. Why celebrate the independence of Pakistan? It came about through genocide and blackmail like most Islamic states. The Muslim League and Jinnah became associated with a bloodbath. In fact, in the northern province of Punjab, which was sharply divided between Hindu-dominated India and Muslim-dominated Pakistan, hundreds of people were killed in the first few days after independence. I will not go into detail in this thought on the independence of Pakistan, but for the most part, Islam is not a religion of peace or tolerance or even consideration for a host nation youth. It is deadly, completely fascist and out of control in our country. I personally feel that we and Europe are containing to our peril a powder keg set to explode that will either immolate us or force us to take steps to protect ourselves. And finally, the last cuckoo in Britain is being flown to see her pals in Turin today. The cuckoo was rescued after being unable to fly south for the winter due to being underweight and unable to carry its tracking device. British Airways have included a seat for a veterinary nurse to keep her company on her trip to Italy when she will become fit enough to finish her journey. She will fly from Italy across the Mediterranean Sea, then on over the Sahara Desert to reach the Congo. This presenter says, what a lovely thought, bless her. I just hope she leaves Turin safely as they eat small birds in that neck of the woods. Perhaps she should have an armed guard, rather like a cuckoo watch. Ironic, isn't it, that we can get a cuckoo to the Congo but we cannot get a terrorist to Jordan. 
You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I wish you all a very good night.